Good morning. I'm gonna, let's go right into the Word. Um, if you can turn to your Bibles, uh, turn to Mark 13. Mark 13, verse 1 through 13, please. Mark 13, verse 1 through 13. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stone, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they were all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceive you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at that time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Um, it's my privilege to share another message with you guys today. Um, so, one thing that has changed in my life is that, as you all know, I got married a couple months ago. It's been a long time coming. My parents were kind of nagging at me because I was go- going over my 40s and I wasn't married. And they said that after you go over 40, and it's not that you didn't get married is because you couldn't get married. Um, But uh, fortunately, I got married to a wonderful, um, better half, uh, and uh, it's been a a, a great ride thus far. Uh, But there comes little challenges as well, because, you know, so one of the things that we we were doing is is kind of getting furniture for our our, our house, our, our, our condo. And... She, you know, we all have different tastes, right? So I have mine, she has hers, and, it, and sometimes we, we don't bicker, but we like, because we're, we're so opposite in these things, she's very frugal. I don't know about me, but, <laughs> but, uh, but she's, she's all about frugalness, she's all about practicality. I look at the design, I look at the colors, right? It should be opposite, it should be like the opposite, right? But, uh, so, there's this couple, there's, so, one day, she was a little bit upset. I could tell she was upset. And she kind of stared at me and looked at me and said, Hey, why are you spending so much time picking and choosing all of these things? Don't you realize this is only temporary? This is only temporary place that you and I are going to live. Why are you Investing all this time and all this, the resources that you want to do. You know, one thing that came to my mind after she said that was, I thought you were supposed to be my helper here, right? And like, you're, you're like, what? Come on, support me here. But I kind of stood there, I kind of didn't say anything because I had no comeback words from that. And I kind of mulled it over, I kind of thought it over, and I said, you know what? That's a wise woman. And that's the reason why I think God has given me, her, in my life. To be able to, to check and balance 
Because they're so easy for us to get into the trap of the, of the things of this world. I stand before you preaching. However, in my personal life, I see the things of this world. And not just I see, I covet as well. And here's my wife telling me, why are you so caught up in this temporary things here we see in verse 1 that Jesus was leaving the temple and I've never been to a synagogue but I heard that it's probably it's, it's, it's elaborate it is exotic okay and I, I, I see no reason why this temple was was any less and it says, and the disciples, were, as they were just mauling over it and walking, looking at this, this magnificent, uh, magnificent building and just, just marveling at all, all the structures. And, and one of the disciples says, hey, teacher, what a massive stone. What magnificent building. In NLT, it says, teacher, look at all this magnificent building. Look at, at the impressive stone in the walls. We're no different. We want the great, the best. As we're driving, we see a house, we're like, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, man, I wish I could see the inside or live in it. We get caught up in the things. I get caught up every single day. This is what happen what's happening in, with the disciples. They were looking and marveling at these things as if this is the epitome what the world has to offer. And then God goes, and Jesus here goes, do you see all these things? Not one of them will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Another version says that they'll be completely demolished and there'll be no stones left. And then Jesus was on to go, and, and, and Peter and James and John and Andrew, and then they were, they didn't understand what was Christ was saying. What do you mean this beautiful, this building, this city, our beloved city of Philadelphia, is going to be destroyed? And, he, and, and in private setting, he, they asked him, what do you mean by this? And Jesus goes on to tell them that don't be deceived, that many will come in my name and say that I am he, but they will deceive you. In those last days, he's talking about the last days here. We are in the last day. And it says that when you hear wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. These things must happen. And he goes on to say, the nations will be against each nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquake, environmental disasters, famine. And then thing here, it says that they, these are the beginning of birth pains. But it says here, so you must be on guard it says, because of my name, you are going to be persecuted. As I was preparing for the message, I was going through, trying to look for some, because why do we, oh, why do I, every time I'm by myself, that I fall into this trap of this prosperity issue. That I try to get what I want. I try to look for the things, the beauty things of this world. And I look, I say, mm, that's good. What if I can have that? Where is these coming from? So I kind of went through uh, and did some research 
And there was a research done by Lifeway. And Andrew, if you can uh, pull that um, slide of the, the next one, please. Yes. So this was a, a survey, a study that was done by Lifeway on the view of prosperity within the Protestant church. Okay? So let's, and they asked these three questions. I, I don't know if you can, uh, I hope you can see it, but I'll read it to you. The first question, or first uh, a view that they asked was to receive material blessings from God, I have to do something for God. And it says here that 26% agree, 70% disagree, and 5% are not sure. In the next view, it says, my church teaches that if I give more money to my church and charities, God will bless me in return. As you can see, the agreement goes higher now at 38% and disagreement at 57 and then 5% not sure. Next view. God wants me to prosper financially. And you see a whopping increase here. It says 69% says, yes, I agree. I wholeheartedly agree that God wants me to be blessed financially. And only 20% say, no. And 10% have no idea. Is this the view that we as Christians are taught? Well, what did Jesus teach us about money and about prosperity, about building wealth for ourselves? This is important because as we read on, it says here, and I'm going to read it in a different version here, in verse 9 through 10, when these things happen, Watch out, you will be handed over to the local councils and beaten in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. For the good news must first be preached to all the nations. What is it saying here? What is the agenda? What is the purpose at the end of days? It's to preach the good news until Christ comes back. Not prosper. Not get what I want. And it says here, these sufferings, it says it's an opportunity to do what? To share the gospel, the good news about Christ. Andrew, if you can go to that next slide for me, please. This, I want to read this to you. This is a, 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 uh, a scripture sharing from one of very renowned pastors in our nation. He, and this church is the, probably the biggest church in the U.S. This, this QT, this scripture uh, uh, message which was on their web page. And let's, let, let's read this together. It says here, and the title is Prosper and Be in Health. Let's read this. It says, so many people are confused about what the Bible means by prosperity. Prosperity isn't just about money. It's about having health and peace in your mind. It's being able to sleep at night and having good relationships. There are many things that money cannot buy that represent prosperity. But having monetary provision is also a part of prosperity. You'll never find one place in the scripture where you, we are supposed to, to drag around not having enough, not able to afford what we want, and living off the leftovers of others. No, we were created to be the head and not the tail. Jesus came that we might live an abundant life. I'm going to stop right there for a minute. I don't know where to begin here. If you agree with this right now, then I highly encourage you to come to one of our pastors 
Because if you agree with any one of these messages, this sentence, then you have a false understanding of the gospel. Do you understand this? This is what's given to us every single day by many different pastors and many different churches. I don't know where to begin to say how bad this is. It says, but having monetary provision is also a part of prosperity. You never find one place in the scripture where we are supposed to drag around not having enough. Has this person read Philippians? Has this person read Proverbs? And he goes on to say, not able to afford what we want. When did Christ taught us to say, go after what you want? He said to deny yourself and living off the leftovers of others. Do we live off leftovers? I know there are parts of this world who, in third, part, uh, third world countries, yes. But this is not what this person is saying. This person is teaching his congregate members who are one of the richest people in the nation, saying, you are, we're feeding off of leftovers. And it says here, and he skews the, 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 the scripture. And he goes, we were created to be the head and not the tail. He's referring to Deuteronomy here. He's referring to the head as, as Israelites to become the head of the nations, all the nations, not be wealthy and not the tail. Not be enslaved by other nations. Let's go to the second paragraph here. It says, remember, as followers of Jesus, I, 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 how, how can you say you're a follower of Jesus when you believe in this garbage? We represent a mighty God here on this earth. We should be an example of his goodness. Do you know what he's saying here? Example of goodness? He's talking about the wealth, the goodness that God gives you. We should be able to, we, we should be so blessed, so prosperous, so generous, so full of joy that other people want what we want. Believe me, I don't want you to see me and think that you see Christ. I want you to see Christ for who he is, a redemptive Christ. goes on to say you don't prove God is good when you live a defeated life are you kidding me are you kidding me when you yield yourself to him and he pulls you out of pit out of the pit that's when he gets the glory no he doesn't God gets glory when we worship him with everything that we have. When we, when we prostrate our hearts to the ground on the front of the cross and say, here I am, Lord. I'm going to worship you. Believe that God wants you to prosper, be in health as you yield every area of your life to him. There's so many contradictions here. And this is what's being preached at this particular church. And there are four, four thousand, no, I'm sorry, 43,000 members at this church who are being fed garbage like this. We're called to be the light. But we are soft. By na naturally, by naturally, we're in darkness. We, our hearts are in darkness. John 3, 19, 12 says this. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of the light. We love darkness. We love to hide in that darkness. Because why? Because in that darkness, I can do whatever I want and get away with it. 
This, this right here, this is garbage. This is in darkness. You can make up anything you want in the darkness. And it goes on to everyone who does evil hates the light. It will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Students, why are you going to church? Why are you going to uh, uh, expensive universities and colleges to get your degree? What is your end motive? What is the end outcome? So that you can make money? So that you can have prestige? So you can get the car you want or the house that you want? Or is it something deeper and meaningful? That God has blessed you with an education that is second to none compared to the other education system in the world? Or is it because you want to use that as a tool, but not as a means to your self-gratification? And to say, God, use this. Use this. So that through this, you be glorified. That through my professional skill set, that I can use this as a tool for your kingdom, to sharing of the gospel. For the rest of us, we try to build a life in this fallen world. And I, I think I shared this last week with my, my college students uh, when I Bible study. I had a friend that who was probably the dirtiest dude ever I ever met in, uh, in college. Um, but I never knew this until one day that his dorm room was always dark. The, I mean, he barely turned on his lights. He had this curtain always shut. But he had his, his bed was, it was always, he had a dark cover. It was all black. His, his pillow case was black. His sheet was black. His, his cover was all black. And I used to spend a lot of time with him, and, and all the time I would sleep there, right? And then one day I got up in the morning, and we're like, yeah. I was like, dude, it's a nice day. Let's, let's open up the curtains. Let's turn the light here. Jeez. So I turned the curtain, and light came through, and turned the lights, and then I was amazed. That bed that I just slept and woke up from was filled with, I, don't, I, I think it was dead skin, with dandruff. I, I can't really even describe the thing that I was seeing, and I was sleeping at that very place. That's how we are. We try to make our world in that filth. We try to say that that is my paradise. See, in darkness, those dandruff, those dead skins, you can't see that. But in the light of Christ, you see what it is. You see the filth. So my question is this. Why are we trying to build my kingdom and our kingdom in this fallen world? It is deceitful. It is detestable. It is dirty. Why are we trying our best every moment of our lives, every time, we try to build this kingdom up. Why? If we understand the filth, if we truly see the dirtiness, can we really actually try to build our kingdom in this world? No. Just like my wife said, this is temporary. Why are you so caught up and the things of this world. Don't you see the dirtiness? Don't you see that this is meaningless? Don't you see that we have eternity to look for? And not only that, rather than being prosper, rather than being in health, rather than going have and, and the word of faith, mo uh, faith movement, there's all the other stuff, like seed of a uh, seed fulfillment of uh, faith movement, all this in the prosperity gospel. Instead of that, here it says, verse 10, it says what? All these things, it's an opportunity to, to tell about Christ. It's about the good news. 
in these last days, let's have our focus on the goodness of Jesus Christ. Let's go out and proclaim his message and not the world see our benefits or blessing, but rather they see the spiritual blessing that comes from Christ. Though, though I may have all these shortcomings, though I may not be complete, though I may sin, but Christ, they, they see Christ in me. That, I believe, is how we should live until Christ comes back, not build a kingdom for myself until I, so that I can live comfortably and die comfortably. College students, be careful. If you're not in the word, if you don't know the word, you will get trapped. You will get sucked in to this to this gospel, gospel and prosperity gospel. And, 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 and they, they package it so well that you won't even realize that, uh, that they're actually doing this. For the rest of us who have established our life, that's a blessing. Let's use that for the gospel to spread. And I'm going to leave with this. One of the ways I want to encourage you is this. Summer's coming. We need to do evangelism. We need to do missions. There are a lot of places right now are not signed up, and some of them, because they're not signed up, they're about to go away. We need to move as the body of Christ. I want you guys, I want all of us at the body of Christ to pray and to see where God wants us to participate, how we want, how He wants us to participate in His plan, His mission. That is because that should be the single most priority for all of us. Not because what I say, not because what a church believes in, but what the Bible says. In the end days. So let's pray. And let's pray that, that the gospel message and the good news should be the priority for all of us as we wait for Christ to come back. Amen? With that, let's pray together. It is so easy to be caught up in the things of this world and how beauty and how awesome, how majestic and it lures us, and we're caught up in that beauty, but we don't realize the dirtiness. And the only way to see that dirtiness is when we are filled with the Spirit, when Christ's light shines upon that darkness, we see the true nature of this world. And when we see that, how can we say, I want this? How can we say, that God wants to want, want me to prosper financially. How can we teach as a church that if you give more, God will give you more? And how can we say receiving material blessing from God that you have to do something, you have to earn something? Christ did not die for this. Christ died so that we might have abundant life, eternal let's look to the eternal things let's look to the eternal things Matthew 6 19 says Jesus said do not store up yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but rather let's invest let's look to the eternal things today let's see how let's ask God say how can I Use my resource, my influence, my education, everything of me. How can I turn that around into eternity? The investing in the eternal kingdom. With that, let's pray together.